Howdy, friends. Welcome to episode number 102. Is that right? I think so. Escaping the Cave Podcast, Todd Zilla X-Pod. I am your friendly and congenial host, Todd. Hello. How are you? I seem to introduce myself about once out of every 10 episodes now. Pretty sure that's improving. <laughs> I have new listeners. Hi there. Nice to meet you. What do you do for fun? Yeah? What do you do for work? Sweet. I assume you're a man. You sound like a man. How long you and your wife been married? She hot? <laughs> I can tell you a story. A radio war story, if you will, and you just did. I won't. I don't have a plan for this episode. It may sound a lot like this all the way through. This might, I don't know. Have a lot of notes here. Have a few pages worth of notes. I came in, I sat down. It's uh, about uh, 20 minutes in front of 4 o'clock in the morning on Monday, February the 1st, 2021. I came in to uh, sit down and, you know, write everything out. Sort of road map it as I want to do, as I do every episode. Because I I will go off in tangents. And I couldn't do it. I just sat here like, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about the Trump impeachment anymore. I don't want to. I, I just, uh, I'm weary. I'm a little weary, I got to say. I've had some really interesting conversations this week. So what I decided to do, this is the tangent thing I'm talking about. What I decided to do, I'm just going to sit here and rap with you today. You and I are going to talk. We're going to have a little chat, a little heart-to-heart. Maybe clean up some uh, overdue material. And I have to examine where the podcast is going to go. You know, hitting 100 episodes. I'm honestly slightly surprised it lasted that long, but that's a big deal. And I, it got me thinking, where, where is this thing going? Not the first time I've thought this. It's not the first time I've talked about it on the show. What am I doing with it? It was supposed to be about propaganda, disinformation, politics, and the social media disease, the uh, the plague of social media. I was doing pretty well with that up till uh, about September of 2019, and it uh, got sidetracked because I could see where this was going. I could see where I was going politically, and I had to decide. I had to, I had to sit down with myself and say, self, I call myself a self as itself. I have to decide, is this the direction that I authentically want to go with this podcast? And if I do, am I willing to endure that on a regular basis? And I don't think I ever really answered that question. The show has never gotten back to the propaganda material. Had a clear, consistent theme till the end of August of 2019. It's never gotten back there. It's touched on it. It's gone here. It's gone there. We did have COVID last year. That didn't help. To my credit, to my defense, and that did not help when uh, COVID-19, but but it wasn't heading that way anyway. We're about a year into the pandemic. I resumed the podcast after a two-month hiatus in January of last year, mid-January. It wasn't heading that way before COVID struck uh, mid to end of uh, February. So the show has lost it's compass and it's all over and it goes as my interests go i don't have a co-host right so i can't really use them to keep me on track 100 episodes got me to thinking about it i don't like the the randomness of it i mean it's not random i'm getting these things out on a regular basis (laughs) for the first couple of years that wasn't happening now it's pretty much every monday and that's cool i'm glad that's happening but the 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 content It doesn't feel like it has a direction. Do I want to get back to propaganda or do I want to move on to something else or just shut the thing down? Right. And I think I'm having this sort of, um, I don't know if uh, purpose crisis is the right word, but I'm questioning this because (laughs) the, the further I've dug into the propaganda material, as I go back and I think back to 2018, when I first started focusing on this stuff, I originally had this idea that I was going to cast Edward Bernays as the evil villain, the the creator of the modern propaganda 
super industry that spans everything from politics to advertising. It, it, it influences everything. The psychological principles behind how to sell a narrative to you and thereby sell a product or a vote to you. I thought I was going to be able to craft him as the villain. That did not happen. And it immediately, almost immediately when I wrote the Media 101 podcast, uh, turned into a It's Us theme. You can't blame the evil propagandists because if there's one thing that I have learned that has been consistent throughout all the material that I have found from psychology to sociology to evolutionary stuff to Jacques Ellul and his uh, study on the craft of propaganda in the 1960s, the one thing that I found is that people cannot do without it. People want it. And there's a very, very, very small degree of distinction to be made between education, information, and propaganda. Information and propaganda sometimes are indiscernible. We're discovering that now. We're, we're awash in that. How do you tell information from propaganda now? We can't even tell truth from false. And we're supposed to find a difference, a distinction between propaganda and information. If you agree with a piece of information, if you find it uh, uh, properly spun, that's education <laughs> to you. Raising awareness, advocating. Whereas if you do not agree with the point of view of the spin, well, that's propaganda. How do you fight through all of this? What is the point? Really, what is the point of trying to raise any sort of awareness? Who am I talking to? What's the point? <laughs> we want it. We need it. We are not truth seekers. We're storytellers. And propaganda is the art of selling an agenda-filled story. It's a story with an agenda. Stories are incredibly powerful. Those are the things that bind us. Narratives, stories, myths, fairy tales, cohesive narratives. The cohesive narrative is the story that binds you to your group. We are this. They are that. We are superior to them because of X. Cohesive narratives. The stories are the, thing that, the things that bind us, not armies, not flags. And Joe Biden, when he decided to run for president last year, came out and said he was running because this is a battle for the soul of America. Remember he said that? He's right. What's going on is a battle for the religious mind, the right to become the national religion, the dominant cohesive narrative that's been in place for a couple of hundred years is under attack. That's called individualism. There's an insurgency that's been in place for decades, collectivism. The God of cosmic justice replacing the God of liberty. There's an idea that I read in a book called uh, uh, Post-Intellectualism and the Decline of Democracy. A guy named Wood wrote this years ago, probably mid-90s. Put it really well. There's freedom in the jungle. You can be completely free to do whatever you want off in the jungle, but it's a dangerous place. You might fail. You might die. You might become prey. Whereas you can find security and fairness, perhaps, in a zoo. Go see those monkeys at the zoo? Safe as hell. Nothing going to happen to them. <laughs> you give them a chance to run? They would rather, instinctively, they would rather be free off in the woods where something could possibly be hunting them at every moment of the day and then shut into that cage. People are the same way. We know that as Americans. It's sort of encoded into our DNA. And we would rather be free and fail then live under a, a system of fair coercion. That's called equity. 
where the outcome is already preordained for everybody. Yes, it's fair. Who wants to live like that? Who wants their entire life sort of planned out for them? That's sort of the idea behind collectivism. One big community all taking care of each other. Less risk, more fairness, in air quotes, more fairness. Except to the guy who's willing to work harder than this person over here. How is it fair that this guy who's working harder than this person over here gets the same reward? How is that fair? It's a question that I that used to, when I was in camp resistance, used to bother me. I used to hate it when my conservative friends would make that argument to me. I've never been able to counter that. I have never been able to counter that from the, from the perspective of the person who's working harder than the guy sitting on his butt over here but getting rewarded the same. I cannot answer that question. But that's the idea behind collectivism, socialism, leftism. Taking care of the less advantaged. Taking care of everyone, as a matter of fact. Praying to the God of external cosmic justice. Where justice is something that's outside of us. Something to be applied. It's something to be seized upon at every moment. Cosmic justice. At every moment. In every nook and cranny of life. It works out how it should. In air quotes. That's collectivism. That's been trying to gain a foothold in this country for a long, 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 long time. It's been trying to gain its foothold in a lot of countries for 100 years, if not longer. That's the battle for the soul of the country. This is not an American creation. Collectivism. Individualism. That's the American myth. The cohesive story on which this country was founded. Individualism. Reason. A republic. <laughs> This has been something that's trying to act as sort of an ideological insurgency for decades. It's trying to colonize. Yeah, colonize. Ideologically colonize. Politically colonize. The United States. Activism. Agitation. Agitation propaganda. I've said before, agitation propaganda is the propaganda of an insurgency. It's designed to destabilize and then replace. Agitation propaganda. Agitation. It's just exactly what it sounds like, agitating, pissing people off. Convincing them, even if they didn't know it before, even if they didn't feel it before, convincing them that they're being oppressed or something's wrong or something is completely unfair and must be changed at this very moment. You must get out in the streets. You must disrupt society. We must agitate you so you get out and disrupt society. And sometimes you have to make things up. Sometimes you have to convince people that things are worse than they really are. Because what if, what if they don't want to? What if they're not really feeling it? Yeah, you know, I'd like to kind of have this sort of kind of the collective thing. It sounds really neat, but you know what? My life doesn't suck. I kind of like it the way it is. Oh, really? Well, let me tell you about this. Oh, my God, I'm so pissed off now. I must raise awareness. A really simplistic way of describing it. But that's what agitation is. That goes back to Lenin. A Vladdy Lenin. He thought that the agitators in the press would be one and the same. Agitprop was a big part of the Russian Revolution, communist society. Especially the revolution. Especially the, uh, the agitation aspect of it. Whole theory behind it. Agitprop. Go read about it. I'm saying that... Uh, this iteration of leftism that's sort of sprouting up, the woke flake crowd, I'm not saying they're communists. Some of them are. <laughs> some of them absolutely are. And so they'll admit it to you. The vast majority of them probably consider themselves social democrats. There's a line of distinction, though, between the far left and the run of the mill left leaning Democrats. But this insurgency is, is one that's been deployed from the far left. And it's here. It's a battle that's been going on for a really long time. That's the battle for the soul of the country. Creep.
Alul wrote that the uh, the side of a propaganda war, if, if someone's being attacked by propaganda, a propaganda campaign, agitation, propaganda, whatever kind of propaganda it is, if that side does not defend itself with propaganda, with the same sort of disinformation propaganda campaign that it's being attacked with, it will be obliterated. It stands no chance. It has to defend itself in kind. If you do not answer propaganda with propaganda, again, we're not truth seekers. You can't answer propaganda with truth. Human beings won't accept it. Human beings need the narrative. They need the story. Simple, factual statements don't work with us. Haven't you noticed? (laughs) You can't do it. You can't ignore it. There's a, a, a documentary that I watched, finally watched on, on HBO. I think it's called Post Truth or something like that. Well, this gets into it. And there are people on here who admit to being those folks who go out and create literal fake news, faking everything, putting it, just trying to get these, these uh, 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 press releases done, get the press around and just get notoriety, boost their brand, make some money, or counter. Uh, leftist narratives, leftist disinformation, leftist propaganda, liberal spin. And they freely admit it. And one of the guys said, well, I know that they're doing it. I see them doing it. I feel like I should counter that with something in kind. That's what I thought of. When, as soon as I heard that, I, just, I cringed. I felt a little dirty. Still feel a little, little dirty after recounting the story. But as soon as I heard him say that, I thought about Jacques Lou and I thought about what he said in the book. It's like, yeah, you have to. You have to counter it in kind, or else you're going to lose. You're going to be obliterated. And so what am I doing here? What am I trying to fight? What am I trying to inoculate you with? You <laughs> So you can read it, not become susceptible to it, but, 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 but to what end? It's a binary choice. If both sides are deploying it, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go with this newfound skill of discernment (laughs) to get away from it, but still remain civically active? There is no place to go. There is no place to go. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. We wouldn't know propaganda if it hit us in the face because it's everywhere. There's no distinction between information and propaganda anymore. I I question how much there ever was. I do know the technology has made it pervasive. That, That may be the difference, the distinction. There may have been less in another era because the technological reach of our toys was so much less. Radio and propaganda, I can tell you this, electronic media... Radio, 1920s, the propaganda industry, 1920s. Almost simultaneously. I find it very, very, very hard to believe that that is a coincidence. And with technology now, I mean, how do you, how do you fight through this? Answer this question for me. I mean, even if, even if you and I were, were able to detect disinformation propaganda 100% of the time, get away from it. Identify it, sequester it, quarantine it, get it away from us. Or at least see through it. What good would that do us? It reminds me of the people who hate people party. (laughs) I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like you. Okay, well, here I am by myself. Right? That's kind of what we're looking at. If we're expecting propaganda to go away, expecting to be able to sequester ourselves away from it, you're going to be on a desert island alone. And using that same principle, if the group that fails or, or rejects the use of propaganda is doomed to lose the war against the propagandist, how then, pray tell, does the anti propagandist win the battle? <laughs> Against pro- you see what I mean? And maybe the best you can hope for, if you're really interested in this stuff, 
is just to be isolated and uninfected. You can't avoid it. You don't have the time, none of us have the time, to decipher it all and figure out what the kernel of truth is residing inside the shit burrito. We can't do that with every piece of information. Enter data overload. We can try. You'll spend more time trying to cut through the bullshit than you will actually learning anything. The disinfecting will dominate your time and you'll never take a step toward enlightenment. Cultural, social enlightenment, whatever you want to call it. I've said this a hundred times on the show. I haven't talked about data overload probably in a few weeks, but that's the thing. When you try to do that and you realize that everything, everything is tainted, everything is poisoned, everything has a dollar sign or a political agenda attached to it. When you realize that, you give up. It's just like, I can't cut through this anymore. I am going to listen to you. I don't know. You're my sage. Come on, sage. Give me what you got. Or religion, your congregation. Whatever. It's natural. So what's the point here? Who am I helping? <laughs> you know, I might be making your life worse. by making you aware of all this stuff. I can't watch TV anymore. I can't watch Saturday Night Live without dissecting the propagandistic message within the comedy skit. And yes, they're there. They're all over the place. You're conservative and you've watched Saturday Night Live. You understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you're a liberal, well, they're not propaganda. They're just funny. Are you, are you sure? Are you sure about that? So maybe that's what I'm doing to you. Maybe I'm making it so you cannot enjoy anything just for the entertainment value anymore. And if you're destined to become confused, you're destined to become lost in this sea of dis disconnected data. If you're destined and doomed to drown in it, if you don't climb in the propaganda lifeboat, the ideological narrative lifeboat, yeah, I'm making that worse for you. Anyway, if all this is the case, if it's a futile battle, if I'm trying to push the Mississippi River upstream, or maybe I'm just having a conversation and a discussion with you, I don't know. But if this is the case, and it's kind of hopeless, I have, a, I have a decision to make, right? I fall into this category as well. I mean, eventually, I'm just going to have to pick something, or I'm going to have to disengage for my own sanity, right? I'm going to have to pick the side that is least noxious to me, or I'm going to have to disengage and find something else to do completely disengage from the social, political cesspool that we're sort of living in right now. I thought about that. I had an idea for that uh, about a month ago. I probably mentioned it on here. I think I did in the first episode back. I was trying to find something positive, something that I was not just against, but something that I could advocate for, something I believed in. Something I enjoyed, something I liked. I had a real, a real epiphany a few weeks back. I asked myself that. I'm like, is there anything I like? Anything I feel good about? Anything that I am in support of? Anything at all anymore? When people would ask me, name something you like, Todd. It used to be baseball. It's not anymore. <laughs> then it was photography. I'm sick of photography because of the marketing angle of it. I rarely take pictures anymore. Part of it's because of where we're at. I'm not impressed with Michigan. I've lived here all my life. I have sailed the Amazon River. I have climbed the Peruvian Andes. I've hitchhiked Highway 1 in California. I've hitchhiked coast to coast in this country. I've seen some wonderful things. I've seen volcanoes. I've swam in the Caribbean. I've gotten the shit kicked out of me in the Mexican Pacific coast by the waves. Lake Michigan doesn't thrill me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a beautiful state, but I'm living in a smaller town. I don't do I can't do street photography as well here as I could in Chicago. The pandemic has killed traveling. I don't do photography now. The best I can do is print my stuff and sell it. 
Don't like it. So therefore, I don't take I don't take pictures anymore. Do I enjoy this? Do I like podcasting? I don't know. I don't like the obligation of it. Like feeling like I have to come in here every Sunday, whether I feel like it or not, and record something or at least worth listening to. I don't enjoy the negativity of it. I don't enjoy swimming in what's wrong with human beings. What's wrong with Americans? What's wrong with the country? Why is the country about to drive itself off a cliff? I don't like swimming in that. During the week, because I do this, because I have visions of writing, that's the other thing that I don't enjoy doing anymore. I have to pay attention to this stuff. Plus, it's, it's really fascinating. This is like a reality show. I feel like I'm good at this. This is what I did for a career when I had one. Pretty similar. Even had the same microphone. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> I feel like I should do something like this, but do I enjoy it? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I think it's, since I'm not getting paid, that's why I take a couple of months off here and there. You know, writing's the other one, and I, uh, no. <laughs> I don't have the, the fire for that anymore either, the focus. This all comes back to that thing, that why, that purpose. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why am I talking about propaganda? Why am I trying to inoculate and educate people against it? To what end? If it's inevitable anyway, why am I doing this? I don't want to sit here and try to paddle up Niagara Falls. Cynically, I think, you can't beat them. Why not join them? And that ties into that uh, you, we, they thing. You know, about a year ago, through a good portion of last year, I guess, <clears throat> I was sort of on a uh, H.L. Mencken kick. I bought a bunch of his books, Prejudices series. Got a bunch of them. He's a great writer, wonderful writer, one of the most entertaining people you're ever going to read in your life. H.L. Mencken. I highly recommend him. Anyway, I think it was inside of his biography. And he had something he called, I think it was called The Smart Set. In one of the publications, maybe it was a Mercury. It's been a long time since I read the biography. But he had a, he had a, a, a column that he did on a regular basis. And it was pretty toxic, <laughs> even, by, even by our standards. If you go read some of the stuff he was saying about religion in the 1920s and what he was saying about the Bible Belt culture in the 1920s, he was ahead of his time in a lot of ways. <laughs> a lot of ways, but... What he did was he talked about them all the time. It was always them. It was always the religious people. It was always those people down south. And he gave his readers a sense of community, a sense of superiority, that they were better than these people that our guy is talking about here. Yeah, those people are idiots. Those people are stupid. And when I read that, in the context of the material that I've been doing, talking about learning about for the last couple of years, it immediately struck his tribalism. Identity journalism via the use of they. As, as best I can tell, there are three voices you can use. We, you, they. Right? Now, if you use they, you're implying that the listener... The consumer of your content is part of the in-group. And we're all talking about the out-group, the they. But not us. We are different. We are separate from they. It's we and they. It never occurred to me before. Before I had read this uh, dissection of what Mencken was doing in his uh, smart set commentaries. Another one you can use is we. I've noticed that uh, Harari and Height right in that sort of context. They say people. 
they say they're like completely detached. Like they're not like people will behave this way. To me, I think he's saying we. It's a way of saying we without using the pronoun. It's sort of almost sort of a pretentious um, <laughs> uh, implication of detachment. I am talking about people. Therefore, I am not a people. I am a, I'm an observer. I, I don't quite understand that. I guess I kind of do if you're, if you're writing clinically. All right, fine. We is very, it's almost forgiving. It's, it's almost like you're, you're what's, the, what's the word Christians use when they go to church and they, they beat on themselves? Supplication. <laughs> Remember, but it's like, oh, we do this, we do this, we do this. This is what we all do. And it's, it, it does form its own community. It forms its own community around, I guess, if you're talking in the context of the material that I've been doing, it, it builds this community around a sense of eh, vulnerability. Admitting that we have these flaws, that we do this. It takes a very special kind of group, I think, to get together and admit that. I don't think a lot of people will do that, not today. A few more, more people, I think, than I would have assumed maybe a couple of years ago will behave and they'll talk in that context, but most people won't. Most people, when they hear that, it's like, yeah, you will. Uh-huh. They want to accuse, they want to attack, they want to blame. And then there's you. <laughs> the pronoun you. It's a pronoun, I hope. I hope I'm not <laughs> screwing that up. Sorry, Mrs. Hale. You is the pronoun that I had drilled into my head. I drilled it into my own head when I when I first started doing radio. Don't say y'all. Don't say you guys. Don't say don't address your listeners as a group of people you want to talk to the individual. One to one. You. You and me. It's you and me talking. You want to create an image in your mind of who you're talking to so you can communicate more intimately. I can feel like I'm having a conversation with you, and you can feel like you and I are having a conversation, a one-sided conversation, but, but a, a conversation nonetheless. One of the first things they teach you when you, when you get your uh, radio training. And when I, when I get going, when I talk about this material, I think a lot of times I'm thinking in the context of we, like we do this, we do this. But when I get to certain spots, something happens, something changes in my mind, and I start seeing this composite character of the left and right extremists. I have two of them in my head, two primary ones in my head, two very specific individuals that I know personally. One on the left, one on the right, they're photo negatives of each other. I have sort of created this composite character. Then when we start talking about specifics, we start talking about specific behavior, maybe on social media or when it comes to informational consumption. When we're talking about very specific things, very specific acts, I create and concoct, I conjure up this composite character that I've crafted in my head. And that's who I begin talking to. I am not talking to you specifically, especially if you're listening to this podcast. Maybe I am. Maybe you do do this stuff. But I think when I start ranting at you, I don't think it's you. I don't think it's you I'm yelling at. Specifically, especially if you are listening to the show, whether or not you engage in behavior I'm condemning or not, doesn't matter because you're listening and you're aware. You're at least interested enough in being aware that I'm not really, I don't feel like in my soul, in my heart that I'm attacking you. I think I'm going past you, going around you, trying to sort of boomerang my words around your person so I can hit that composite character standing behind you. You're in the way. This is what I think I'm seeing in my head. I've been trying to get my head around this for a really long time because I hear it. I get going and I, you know, I, 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 I do my thing. I don't want to get in the way of it because, you know, I, I like the stream of consciousness stuff a lot. I like to let it sort of craft itself and let it, let it do what it's going to do. But I hear it later on. It's like, who am I talking to? Why am I... Showing what Brian called the contempt for the listener. Why am I throwing these words at you when they're not directed directly at you? Because the, pers- the people that I have crafted this composite character out of, they're not listening to this show. I promise you. 
Why am I doing that? I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated because, as I said in the last segment, I don't think there's any hope and it bothers me. I don't like feeling like I'm wasting my fucking time here. But I also feel like I have an obligation. Because I think that I was one of the very first people to, in fact, I know I was one of the very first people to start talking about this a couple of years back. I've been talking about this since 2016, actually. The social media material, when nobody else was doing it, before the election. Tooting my own horn, yes. I have to do it, nobody else will. But I feel like I have an obligation to it. I have the time, I have the interest in studying this. I have the time to do it that you don't. So I feel obligated to take what I find and put it out there and say, here. It's almost the see something, say something idea. This is coming. You better, why, you know, you might want to look up the road a ways. I know you're busy with your lives and I know you don't have time to pay attention to all this stuff, but look over there. That's what I feel like I'm doing. And I feel obligated to do that. Even if I'm not getting paid, I feel an obligation to take what I've found and say, here. But I also know that after researching this stuff, I said in the last segment, I'll say it again, after researching this stuff, I know there is next to no hope. And I know that the technology that we have... (laughs) Never seen the movie Stargate? The original one. Cheesy as hell. Used to be one of my favorite freaking movies. Oh. Such a great premise, but the actors ruined. <laughs> it really did. Anyway, Stargate, they uh, 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 find this gate because it goes to the stars. <laughs> sort of like um, a wormhole thing. They go to this other galaxy. There's this guy, god there, right? This alien that has this, this technology, and he's enslaved the indigenous peoples of this planet. The guy is based like on Egypt. I think it's Ra. I think it's, it's who the Egyptians are supposed to have created the deity Ra uh, as a result of meeting him or something like that. Anyway, anyway, I know there's a reason I'm rambling. Anyway, the Stargateers, people who traveled through the Stargate to the system to check it all out, uh, uh, took an army guy with them or an army team with them, and they brought a bomb because they were supposed to blow it up if it, it posed a threat to the earth, right? And they get there and, oh my God, there's this alien, all this technology. Oh crap, holy crap. Uh, bad things happen. And the alien captures him and captures the bomb, right? And then he takes this mineral that they're mining on this this alien planet, puts it in the bomb, and now it's gonna it's it's like exponentially more powerful. He's gonna send it back through the Stargate, blow it up on Earth. Oh my God, Armageddon! Right? And there's a love story in there. It gets cheesy, but it's it's a fun movie. It used to be one of my favorite movies when I was younger. Anyway, long way to go around this to say that social media is like that mineral that that alien put in the bomb. When it comes to propaganda, when it comes to disinformation, when it comes to being confused and drowning in data, when it comes to crutching upon narratives, cohesive narratives or ideological narratives or identity narratives, divisive narratives, us versus them, we versus they, (laughs) right? We versus you or you versus them. Social media has taken this and it has compounded and multiplied it exponentially. It's compounded the data overload. It's compounded the inability to tell truth from falsehood. It has also exploited the fact that human beings are not truth seekers, that we are storytellers. It's given us so much more material to craft our narratives with, to craft with which to craft our fictions An endless stream of them. Narratives, 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 stories, cohesive myths. Coming back to the same thing a lot, I'm convinced of it. I am convinced that narratives, if I were to wrap this show up with a series on one particular thing, I think it would have to be narratives. And how often we use them and how powerful they are. When you add this sort of technological firepower to all of this, I 
I think what we're seeing right now is just the beginning. I've said this for when it was here. I was saying it for a long time. And I think the stuff that we're seeing right now, it's only the beginning. If you, I know that everything's been quiet since January 6th. I think you've got to be sort of a silly fool to think it's going to last. There are about 15 different directions I could take the conversation from here. Talking about ideological warfare. Talking about tyranny. Talking about Joan Didion's morality. The moral imperative. How easy it becomes when you think something is a moral imperative to compel it upon someone else. It doesn't matter. It's not ideologically specific. The folks who charged the Capitol on January 6th believed that their election was stolen from them. I don't care if it's stupid or not. I don't care if it was a great law. It doesn't matter. They believed it. They thought it was a moral imperative for them to forcibly try to correct what they saw as a blasphemous fraud against their government and their constitution. They saw it that way. They didn't have to go very far in order to get to the point where they were going to coerce or compel Congress to act in accordance with their moral imperative. What about the other side? The right? Trump's people? It used to be maybe 15, 20 years ago. I remember this. They were the ones who were wallowing in moral imperatives. Focus on the family, all those religious nuts. They were the ones who were boycotting businesses because they were not sufficiently pure. Those roles have changed. Those roles have changed drastically. Boycotting a business, boycotting a product, boycotting an advertiser is not a woke invention at all. And it's amazing how many people, how many liberals despised cancel culture when it was a conservative thing. Coercion. I digress a little bit. This isn't over. This hasn't ended with Donald Trump. It's only begun. We should be able to see that clearly now. They took a couple of weeks. There may have been maybe a two- or three-week window after the attack on the Capitol, after the insurrection, whatever you want to call it, and up until maybe this week, where Republicans were perhaps trying to figure out a way around Trump, a way to get rid of Trump. Is this the time? Can we separate from him and do it safely for the party? There may have been a time they they may have been able to be convinced to do it. That time has passed. And I suspect that that thing that I was just talking about was a mirage anyway, because the Republican National Committee, right after the insurrection, the RNC was already bowing in fealty to Trump. And one of the meetings, it might have been a national meeting, I forget what it was, but they were singing his praises right afterwards while these other Republicans like McConnell were pretending that they were, you know, having a soul, (laughs) having a constitutionally loyal soul. The RNC sort of showed where the Republican Party was going to go, I think. Maybe there was benefit of the doubt. Maybe there was a window right there for two or three weeks where, where Trump could have been extricated from the system. He can't now. They've already said, and I, you've got to take them at their word. We've seen this before. They are not going to convict him no matter what in this second impeachment. Therefore, they are not going to be able to bar him from holding f- uh, future office. That means he's still a political entity. That means he's still is the kingmaker in the Republican Party. There are very few leaders. There are some leaders standing up. Some Republican leaders are standing up. Peter Meyer, right up the road. Justin Amash's old seat. There's something about that seat in Grand Rapids, I'm telling you. Way to go. He's going to get primaried. There's already somebody standing up, a Trump bot standing up, saying you're going to primary Pete Meyer. He's been in office, what, a month? There are some, in addition to Mitt Romney, Liz Cheney. Whoever else. There are others. Sass comes to mind. There aren't very many. And not only that, the rest of the party. (laughs) What's her name? Bobert. Lauren Bobert from Colorado. I think I've talked about her on this show. Marjorie Taylor Greene. I can actually say her name now without having to look it up. That's how much she's been in the news because that's how batshit she is. 
unapologetic Trump supporter. She's trying to she's trying to channel Trump. I'll never apologize. I'll never give in. She is. She's trying to channel him. The needle is not moving toward the middle, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't feel the needle moving toward the middle on either side here. The needles on both sides are just, they're, they're pushing themselves apart. Two years' time, when the midterms arrive, <laughs> I hope you're being realistic about this. And I think, I think most of you are. I think you know, right? We know how this is going to go. And down the road, one of these two camps, one of these two radicalizing cults are going to win. They are going to maintain control over the national religion, the cohesive myth. And what are you going to do about the other half of the country? Are you going to pacify them? I have never gotten an answer to this. Yeah, I don't know what to do here. I'm leaning this a certain way. I just don't know. I don't want to have to choose between one of these two cult compounds. I don't want to have to choose between woke town and Trump town. And I feel like I do at some point. Otherwise, what, what is the point of this show? What is the point of what I'm doing? It's not ever going to reach enough people. You're not going to be able to interest enough people in this stuff. And even if you do, again, I'm going to repeat, I know I'm being redundant, but even if you do, where do they go then? How do they correct the informational problem in their own lives? How do they curate their information better if there's no source of decent information from which to gather? Those sources of information don't make money. It's a business. It's a for-profit business, first and foremost. If it doesn't make a profit, it doesn't exist. For it to exist in this environment, you have to give people what you want. We used to call it in music radio, play the hits. Again, I know I'm talking in circles here. I know I've already been here. I just don't know what to do. I have two choices. I can either keep going and doing what I'm doing, trying to get this thing back on track, trying to get folks back on propaganda, disinformation, and just eviscerating social media on a, on a weekly basis, trying to avoid the politics as much as I can, but you can't avoid politics with that material. <sighs> can't do it talked about this already or behind door number two alex mixing my game shows find something specific to focus upon pick a side but which one it's easy to attack trump it's easy to attack his supporters to mock people like marjorie taylor green of that her name I get it right that time? I hope I got that right. It's easy to mock the new Michelle Bachman down there in Georgia. It's easy to mock Bo Bear, Bobert, Cubert. <laughs> I call her Cubert. Other in Colorado. And all those nut jobs. It's easy to mock them. But there's more to this than that. Because I see the kernel of truth that resides beneath all the bullshit. I understand the complaint that a lot of Trump supporters have. I understand the path that they have walked to get to the point where they can look at Donald Trump, they can hear his bullshit, no matter what it is, and ask themselves, hmm, can I believe this? They look over to the left, they see the woke flake hordes over there. Yeah, I think I can believe this. Fuck it. God, I, I don't know where I saw this. I may have read it. I don't know. But somebody was saying, these people don't believe anything. They're just voting that way because they're voting against Democrats. Because they're not a... De yeah, that's exactly right. The far left... Let me repeat this. Let me start over. The center left has to wear everything that the far left does. Has to wear the riots, the continuing riots in Portland. Remember these riots were all about Trump. Trump caused all this. Well, the, the riots are continuing in Portland right now <gasps> over Biden. The left is wearing that. I don't care if it's Antifa. I don't care if it's anarchists, whatever. These are leftists. These are uh, pseudo-communists. They can call themselves anarchists all they want. Go read the stuff. They're, these are communists. Anyway, 
the left, all of it, the Democratic Party, the, the Democratic Party as a whole, when it comes and pertains to and relative to the people who voted for Donald Trump, wear it. The same way that Republicans wore whatever Donald Trump did during his term. Why aren't you denouncing this? Well, a lot of people on the right are asking, well, why aren't you denouncing that? Hmm. There's still protesters on CNN. These rioters in Portland, still protesters. These people were arrested and charged with rioting. And CNN's still calling them protesters, not rioters, because they're leftists. Yes, this happens. There's this really weird thing we used to say. It's like there's a real clo- a real small distinction between a patriot and a terrorist. Or a guerrilla. A patriot and a guerrilla. During the revolution, patriots, our patriots, would have been considered guerrillas to the other side, right? Well, rioters and protesters has the same thing going on. If you agree with the cause for which they're rioting, well, they're protesters. If you dis- disagree with it, they're rioters or terrorists. You can, you can apply that to the Capitol. You can apply this to the, the riots or demonstrations or protests that are going on in Russia right now. It's just one small example of the inability to agree on truth, to agree on a shared reality. And that is due to the propaganda, that is due to the, to the data overload, and due to the narratives. The competing and mutually exclusive narratives trying to coexist at the same time within the borders of a country. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. There has to be a cohesive uniting myth. One, unity is not coming back, my friends. I'm going to tell you why. You can't have it in a fragmented society, in a society addicted to its own identity, to its own micro-identities. You can't have African Americans and Asian Americans and gay Americans and white Americans, female Americans. You can't have all of that. You've got to have Americans. That's the cohesive group. Americans. When you have these individual little fragmented sects within sort of advocating for themselves, all advocating for one for themselves individually, trying to climb and claw their way up, you know, the special interest ladder. You don't have a cohesive group. You don't have a cohesive identity. You don't have a flag to rally around. You don't have a story. You've got 100,000 stories, all competing to be dominant. Understand? When you see people attacking statues... They're not attacking George Washington. They are attacking the national myth. They are attacking the story. They want to replace history with their own. They want to replace the contemporary temples with their own. It's an ideological insurgency. It is colonization Again, you're not going to stop it. So what, what am I supposed to do? You know, I have, again, I, I, I go back and I, I'll, I'll say it again. I, I'm leading a certain way. I've been leading a certain way the last couple of days. I don't know that I really want to do it, but I do know that I don't want to. I don't want to try to paddle up Niagara Falls. Well, this might be the absolute worst episode I've ever done. I confess, um, there's a reason for this. <laughs> I went to the dispensary today, uh, yesterday actually, gobbled part of an edible before I sat down. I just wanted to see if I could sit down and try to communicate with it. And I wanted to see what the little white chocolate thing would do too. But I don't know that this was a successful experiment at all. Not that I took that much. I don't know how much of an effect it had. Anyway, uh, one final thing I want to mention, uh, maybe two or maybe ten. We'll see how it goes. I did find another guy in the um, psychological field. 
this week. I've discovered uh, <laughs> the works of Alfred Adler. Hadn't heard of him before. Maybe you had. I contacted Brian, asked him about it. He said he's kind of a big deal. He's a rather big deal in psychology. I did a little you know, online research about him and found out that he was a contemporary, a colleague of Sigmund Freud. Freud invited him into his little uh, sort of small Wednesday group of uh, people back around the, that time, turn of the century, a little later, to discuss theories in psychology, throw their ideas, have them picked apart, stuff like that. He was a peer, not a student of, a peer. Sigmund Freud, and one of the groundbreakers, I guess, in uh, psychotherapy. And he had some really interesting things to, um, to say, and probably has a lot more. Again, I'm not well-versed in this guy at all, but as it pertains to propaganda and as it uh, pertains to narratives specifically, one of the things I wrote down was that he was talking about fictions and how they're the uh, internal narrative and pertains to the life story. I've talked about this before. Who was that? That might have been that might have been height. But how we all have this narrative that we're telling, of course it's a narrative, this biographical narrative, this biographical story that we're telling in our head about, you know, if we were going to re- make a movie about our life, this is what it would look like. Maybe we have the narrator going in the background. And then he did this. But looking forward also, we, we, we start to write the fiction or start to imagine the fiction as we want it written in the empty pages that are you know still lying open in the notebook. Adler started talking about this life story thing. The novel we each write, the novel we star in, in our own minds. He started to tie that into purpose. He started to tie that into different things. One of those things is striving for significance, meaning and purpose. Significance, though. And that part screamed religion. It screamed politics to me, especially politics in this day and age. Stuff sort of melds up, I think, with Alul, obviously, McLuhan, Postman, all of them. The loss of individual significance with technology, with being isolated away from human contact, modernization, automation. Slowly over the last couple of hundred years as technology has grown, our connection, our one-to-one connection with the world organically and with being a purposeful and meaning, meaningful human being has diminished. We're only a cog in the machine, whereas before we were responsible for everything. We had to create our own lives. We had to survive. Had to protect our children, our families. Now all we do is go to work and play one small role, come home, sit on the couch. Oh, what Trump do today? How's Biden fixing America today? Striving for significance. This is a big deal, I think, as it it applies to extremism. The search for lost significance and meaning. This is a a Frankel thing. A guy that uh, survived a concentration camp wrote about it. Wrote about how he found meaning at Auschwitz. I think it was Auschwitz. Wherever it was, Frankel, Victor Frankel, read him. First half of his book is excellent. But that search for significance and meaning also makes us susceptible to religious dogmas and, of course, ideological doctrines of all kinds, including fanatical political doctrines. One final thought I'll leave you with. You're going to hear a lot more about this, I think, in the uh, weeks and months ahead. Loss of significance. That can happen within an individual life as well. It doesn't just happen to a generation or, you know, a... uh, succession of generations, it can happen within an individual life. Loss of significance. Loss of meaning. Loss of purpose. Loss of place, perhaps. 10, 15 years ago, I started hearing about how in the Middle East, young men who'd been disenfranchised and perhaps sexually repressed had become susceptible to online radicalization being radicalized, being lured in online, and then radicalized into Islamic jihadism, ISIS. 
There's all sorts of talk about, oh, why is that? Hmm, what could be the cause of this? How could this be treated? <laughs> Empathy. Empathy for these young, ostracized, disenfranchised boys who were susceptible, vulnerable to online manipulation, online radicalization. You could apply that loss of significance there, I suppose. Maybe. I don't know. I don't live in the Middle East. I'm not an expert on, Amer- on Islamic culture. I am, however well-versed on American culture. I'm also a man of a certain age. And I think you could apply that same standard, that same psychological empathy to the group, the one group, the only group in the United States whose death rate is rising. They call it due to deaths of despair. It comes to suicide, It encompasses alcoholism, drug abuse, drug addiction, overdose. Avoiding the doctor because you don't care. So you have treatable health problems that pop up and kill you. Young. Middle-aged white men. The only demographic in the country. It could be the, the world. I don't know, but I know it's the U.S. Something like between 40 and 60. That age group. That is the only death rate that's rising, and it has been for a while. Coincidentally, huh, have you been seeing the the video that's been on CNN on loop for the last two weeks? What demographic did you see there? Huh. Am I excusing it? No more. Then those people were excusing those poor young Arab boys who didn't have meaning, didn't have purpose, and were vulnerable to online radicalization. Different age group. Yet in this country, I've seen people talk about the deaths of despair thing, about how middle-aged white men are dying, killing themselves. I've seen people talk about it. Not very many. Not very many at all. It's enraging. I've had conversations with people, and I, they, they won't come on the show, and they won't come on this program to say <laughs> what they said to me because they don't feel like they can. But it's almost a universal refrain. That pisses people off. Everybody has an advocacy group. Everybody has a fucking hashtag. Yet the one demographic in this country whose death rate is rising consistently and has been for years is not allowed to advocate for itself. It has to sit here as the whipping post and the punching bag, apparently responsible for every ill in society. We deserve what we're getting. I've seen that a million times. Remember we were talking a couple of weeks ago maybe about uh, picking yourself a piece of agitation propaganda. There are very few things that have pushed me further and further away from the left than watching people gloat about middle-aged white men killing themselves. I know some of these people. I've had friends. I've had several friends. Several people I know that I went to school with that have either drank themselves to death, at least two that I know of there, a couple of overdoses, one or two suicides, one cancer case that I know of, another heart attack, he didn't know anything about it. He didn't know anything about that he had a heart condition. Another guy had no clue that he had cancer. He had six weeks. He, was given, he had six weeks after he was diagnosed until he was dead. And didn't go to the doctor. Why? I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if he was living in despair. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Nobody asked. Nobody cares. Now, that's a minority. Well, why didn't he get doctor care? You need to be careful if you reside upon the left side of our little spectrum. Am I talking to you? You? Yeah, I think I am. I, I know a few of you, specifically our leftists, and you need to be careful here. 
especially when you how you how you handle this subject and this topic. People see it. People see the difference in tone. Different types are being advocated for. Whereas people in Appalachia, in the Ozarks, poor people, some of the poorest people in the country live in West Virginia. Where's their advocacy group? Where's their hashtag? And you wonder why and how people become open and susceptible to seeing the truth, the tiny, tiny sliver and kernel of truth that resides beneath the bullshit messaging. And once people see that, once they have something to hold on to, once something to balance themselves with in this typhoon, some anchor of truth, in this hurricane of bullshit by which to study themselves with. They're no longer within your camp. They're no longer under your spell. Remember what I was talking about before? Patriots or guerrilla? Depends on your perspective and your point of view. Well, theirs has been changed. Now they can start changing the definition of who and what it is they see you as. How did 75 million or 72 million people vote for Trump? Are you sure you need to ask that question? A tiny fraction, I wouldn't even consider it a fraction of the number of people that voted for Trump were in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. A tiny fraction. Not everybody who voted for Trump was them. You could probably claim and argue that most of the people who felt that way might have been in Washington, D.C. that day. They may have found a way to get there no matter what. A good percentage of those people, the militant right, probably were in D.C. Who were the other 75 million people? Why did they vote against Joe Biden? Why did they vote for that? The problem the left has and the problem Democrats have it has nothing to do with economics. It has nothing to do with socialist economic theory. It has nothing to do with welfare. It has nothing to do with the stimulus. It's the culture war, stupid. It's the pronouns. It's letting boys play on girls' sports teams because the little voice in their head, the little gender voice in their head, tells them they can. It's the people who are out of the protest carrying signs that says, my abortion was glorious, thank you. The people in Portland, the people around the country, rioting, 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 screaming, defund the police. How many people voted for Trump just because of that? Now, this isn't over by a damn sight. Trump's too quiet. You know, they say, I've always heard this since I was a kid, if there's going to be a tornado, it gets really calm beforehand, right? Now, yeah, I know, I'm all over the place. But um, I get it. I, I, I think I have finally, after having these conversations with different people, different ideological bends, liberals, conservatives, straight, gay, I've talked to them. And there's a common refrain there. There is. That this identity politics, protected species bullshit has gone too far. Personally, I'm sick and tired of hearing how Biden's administration has to look like America. I really am. 60% of this country is still white. That means the other 40% is split up between every other minority group. What's the percentage of black people in this country? Is it 15 It's like somewhere between 12 and 16%, I think, last time I checked. Less than one-third white people. Hispanics make up a bigger share, almost 20%. Still, one-third of the number of one race in this country, white people. They're going to be in the minority here. No, we're not. We're not anywhere near being in the minority. We still are three times the population. Of black people. At least. Probably four. Definitely three times the Hispanic population. And they're the two biggest minority groups. 
You wonder why this divisive identity politics and these people, these, these identity politicians telling everybody that black or that white people are constantly oppressing everybody, that we are the root of all evil, that we are not allowed to advocate for ourselves at all, that we are a flawed demographic group. And you're wondering, how did Donald Trump get 75 million people? Fuck you. You know why. If you don't know why, I just gave you a freaking tree to go sniff up. <laughs> Who am I talking to? <laughs> this is a weird podcast. Oh, I want to think of this. I'm sitting here debating as I wind it down. I'm debating whether or not I want to release it. <laughs> All over the freaking place. But I kind of like the pot thing. That was kind of neat. I did a couple of these on mushrooms once, a couple of years ago. A little tiny, a tiny amount. It wasn't that great. No more alcohol, though. Learn my lesson there. EscapingTheCave.com is the website. I have a Substack site as well. You can check out Twitter. You can check out Facebook. Page is still up there. Not doing a lot. Toned it down a bit. Twitter, eh, fuck it. I do appreciate your patronage. Thank you. Remember so much for giving me your time. Maybe I'll do a normal one next time. We'll see. Till next time, so long. <laughs>